Hi and welcome to the podcast You're Having Tea with Alice. This week's episode is with Ian Smith, who is uh, one of the best comedians I know. I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast as much as I enjoyed having the conversation. We spoke about uh, nepotism and class and uh, the pros and cons of both of those things and how to negotiate uh, a world in which those things are very real. I hope it's just I really like talking to Ian. He's got a really interesting mind. Um, if you enjoy this podcast, please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Alice Fraser is the place to go. I also do two writers meetings a week and a salon and the occasional book club. So you get quite a lot of value for your money. It starts at a dollar a month, patreon.com slash Alice Fraser. I'll let you get on with listening to the podcast. You're having tea with Alice. Hi and welcome to the podcast. You're having tea with Alice. Who are you and what are you drinking? So I've got a peppermint tea, largely because of the title of the podcast. It's not my go-to drink, but it's an aspirational drink. I feel like I should be drinking this. That's excellent. Okay, first of all, what is your go-to drink? And secondly, why do you find peppermint tea an aspirational drink? Well, I would say my go-to drink would be like anything with quite a high sugar content and a fizz to it. Like I have quite <laughs> a um, adolescent um, drinking palate, so it would ideally be like Dr Pepper or Full Fat Coke or an Iron Brew. And I think my teeth and body um, aren't thankful of that. So I'm trying to, as a kind of New Year's resolution, I've said to myself I'll only have one fizzy drink a week as like a treat, which feels pathetic for a 35-year-old to have to really <laughs> like hammer that into himself. Um, but yeah, so I'm trying to avoid sugar and trying to find drinks that are good for me but will give me a bit of energy. That's an interesting one. I My brother swears by kombucha. Yeah, I think that's what I might need to move on to. I'm worried about whether the fizz element makes it feel like I'm going against my resolution, but I've heard this is good fizz. Well, yeah, look, I mean, I don't know how much of this is like health washing, though, because it feels like it's one of those borderline things that people believe is healthy and then they drink too much of it if you know mm. what I mean if it's the only thing you're allowed like those people who go yeah. on keto and then they just eat bacon 100% of the time and you kind of or, yeah. or they do the pe paleo they, they take the one exception or the one thing that's meant to kind of balance out quite a um, quite a uh, sort of restrained approach to food or drink and then they they just hammer that thing because it's the one indulgence. Mm. I don't know. I haven't done research into kombucha. You need to ask my brother. He makes his own, so he's like yeah. well down that rabbit hole. Yeah, I'm worried that kombucha will be the like the vaping of the drink world <laughs> and people will do it for a while going, this is fantastic, we're not smoking anymore. And then people will start to say, no, those chemicals are also bad. Yeah, yeah. have you um, heard of popcorn lung? That's yeah. a thing. That vaping people get. That's a real thing. That's oh, not that a real thing that thing? I made up. Yeah, Popcorn that's not lung. just a hilarious joke. It's a, um, yeah, apparently if you breathe in vapor, it can give you what's called popcorn lung, which sounds oh. delicious. Um, yeah, they should change the name because I, I immediately thought, what a, what a funny thing that is. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a shame. There are some diseases that sound funnier than others but are potentially more serious. So much yeah. of this stuff is about branding, and it really shouldn't be. Yeah, it should be the more serious the disease, the more serious the name, and then a sort of lower thing like... Even IBS, I think, could be funnier, name-wise. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But, like, chlamydia is objectively a funnier name than gonorrhea, mm. and so it sounds yeah. less serious to have chlamydia than gonorrhea. I have not had either, so I don't know how serious either of them actually are. Maybe mm. maybe that, that does reflect the real um, yeah. status Yeah. Maybe it them. could just be a straight swap with the names. That's if doing true. a sort of announcement of saying chlamydia is gonorrhea now. Just, <laughs> just to let you all know. 
what have you been wrestling with of late? Um, yeah, I was trying to think of the sort of stuff that's on my mind. One thing I think um, I've got really, I've maybe have a chip on my shoulder about, and I guess is a nepotism, or maybe money in general. But um, yeah, I think I'm sort of struggling to engage with some like TV or film or media um, as soon as I kind of find out like the writer or director or maybe main cast members from a sort of dynasty of some form or a kind of in, like a kind of multimillionaire background. I find it difficult to um, take away the sort of chip on my shoulder and go, oh, maybe that person does want to do the thing they're doing. Instead, I'm like, of course they're doing the thing they're doing. It's so easy for them. Um, and I think that's maybe something I need to um, get better at, um, either ignoring or... It's a, No, I don't think you need to ignore it, but it's, it is an interesting sort of feature of the world because there's a kind of... Um... So, for example, with actors or models, you go, well, of course they're going to be actors or models. They have won the genetic lottery. They look... Yeah, yeah. ...otherworldly. They don't look like humans. They reflect light in a particular way. You know, with that kind of stuff, you're like, well, obviously, it's two incredibly hot people have made another incredibly hot person, and that's yeah, yeah. sort of a natural result. Or this idea that talent is inherent... That you know maybe Tiger Woods's kid is going to be very good at golf because he's Tiger Woods, mm. but also these are kids who, if they want acting classes, like Martin Scorsese can come around and give them some tips. Yeah. And because their parents have money, then they can afford all of the best lessons. And you know, yeah. So I I agree with this kind of. I'm torn about it. I'm torn about it. Mm. And also I think the confidence that comes with, like, um, yeah, I, I guess that particular level of um, uh, sort of background, there's a confidence that comes with not having previously had to worry, say, about is this the right job for me to be doing or am I going to make enough money I'm going to have to get this job as well to make sure I can do the thing I like. You kind of have this, um, it almost feels like an inherent ease with, if this doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world. And I feel like it will work out because things seem quite fortunate for me. I think you're maybe less likely to to build that kind of, Maybe what I think is quite like a northern mindset of people being like, oh, just my luck, or you are knowing me, this is going to happen. Um, I imagine if you're like the child of a sort of multimillionaire filmmaker, you're not going to be walking around the house going, oh, this is typical, um, something's going to go <laughs> wrong. Um, you're probably going to think, life is fantastic. Yeah, life is fantastic. All you need to do is work hard at the thing you love and things mm. will work out because, of course, yeah. whenever people ask how someone got successful, they say, I worked really hard at the thing I loved and I didn't take no for an answer. And, you know, you could also get that story from an unhoused person on the street. Yeah, I worked yeah. really hard at the thing I loved and I didn't take no for an answer and I sunk all my life savings in and yeah. then everything went wrong. Um but when it works out, then, yeah, it can make you believe that, yeah. But then I guess none of us deserve anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and also, like, I, one thing I was thinking is, like, if I was in that position, you know, if I was, like, um, I think, like, the wealthiest comedian, but someone like Michael McIntyre, and my kid wanted to go into acting, then I think I'd be, like, well, you should go to this drama school. It's like the best, and like, let's see how we go about doing doing that. Like, you know, as in, you'd obviously want them to get in through their talent, but I guess you'd also be thinking, I wonder if it helps, like me saying, I'm Michael McIntyre. Like, 
I, I don't think I would not do that for my kids. So I kind of have like, there's no, um, you're trying to think, who, who am I angry at? Who am I blaming? Like, it's not the parents because you would want the best for your kids. Um, and if the kid wants to do that thing, you can't say, no, you're not allowed to do the thing that your parents or family do. Because you wouldn't say that to like a butcher's son of saying, no, it can't be, you know, and sons on the butcher's name because your dad was a butcher. It's too easy for you to go into butching. Butching? That can't be there. <laughs> but- butchery? <laughs> butchery. You can't do butching, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know who I'm who I'm annoyed at. I guess I'm just, I guess I'm just annoyed at the concept rather than yeah. anyone individually. But I think that's sort of the problem is that it is a, like what they call a systemic issue because there's no one mm. person who you blame. Like if you're the kid who wants to do acting, why would you not take the cards you're dealt? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and and why would you believe in a life that everyone has hardship? Why would you believe that your life is easier than other people's? You know, just mm. it wouldn't necessarily occur to you. Yeah. But then, like, see, on the other hand, he's like just a throwing something in the mix thing. Mm. I kind of understand the argument for nepotism in, like, the very traditional sense where you go, I want to hire someone. I'm going to hire someone who I know their uncle or I know their father or I, I can, mm. they might, you know, they're, they're someone who I have a, a social connection to, so they have to perform. I have a guarantee of their good behaviour by virtue of this social network yeah, that yeah. means that I can be like, hey, can you get your son to pick up the slack? And then the son is like, if I don't do well, I'll shame my uncle or whoever recommended me to this position. So like, mm. I see how functionally it is a really... Um, it's like a it's like a insurance when you're taking yeah. a risk on hiring somebody new but then like while i can understand that on like a village level once you mm. get into kind of these global kind of systems it's impossible to yeah. make that work and it's not fair and it's not right that someone else shouldn't get a chance just because yeah. this person knows that person yeah, but you're right. It's it's hard to pinpoint whose responsibility it would be that, like, if you're um, the kind of head writer on something and you're assembling a writing team and you went to university with four or five other writers and you know them, it's very easy for you to go, well, I know these two guys, I know this girl, they're, they're good and... I know them, I know I can work with them and that we get along and we have shared experiences and all this kind of stuff. Why wouldn't you do that rather than try and trawl the world of writers to try and find the most diverse representation or someone who really needs a leg up? Like, well, I was once part of a kind of a from scratch assembled writing team mm. uh, here and... It really didn't work. There was no chemistry. Yeah, yeah. We weren't aligned on our vision. I think they kind of put us in a room and said, come up with whatever you want to come up with. And it yeah, just didn't yeah. work out. I think if we'd had a clear mission, we might have cohered into a team. Or mm. if we'd been a pre-existing team told to do whatever we wanted, we might have come up with something. But as it was, yeah, I, you know, I, I it, it, it was not, it didn't work out. Yeah, I do think that's like, doesn't work very yeah it's kind of like a good counter argument to what frustrates me because yeah I, I see that a lot in comedy occasionally you see a group of people who have been put together and like right now you're a sketch show because you're five people we're excited about but you just think well that's that's never going to be as good as if you just let one of those people pick the four people they work with and have a chemistry with well, and on the flip side of this, like, mm. as a woman in comedy, 
for so many years fighting that idea that you're not funny inherently mm. you're not funny what for for a lot of bookers what that means is we don't share life experiences i don't get you i'm not comfortable with you you're not one of my mates you don't reflect my mm. own humor back to me so you're not funny yeah, which is not yeah. untrue for them it is true mm. they're going to obviously in a room with your mates you're going to laugh more people who have shared life experiences people who look like you people who have had the same background as you are going to be able to hit those buttons in you more instinctively because what they find funny you'll probably find funny but equally your audience is going to be diverse so why not bring in people who are funny to a, as wide a range of yeah, people yeah. as possible obviously that kind of nepotistic comedy scene thing is a thing that's affected my life you know mm. and now there's kind of this backlash to it that yeah i don't know if it if it's effective or not well i i kind of i think that's something that's frustrated me in the past like with that so i one thing that i think makes me feel less sympathetic towards like what we were saying earlier of like people who benefit from that is often when they're interviewed and asked about it their answers are awful I think um, J.J. Abrams' daughter, Gracie Abrams, is a musician, I think, or maybe does acting as well. But um, I'm sure I'm sure they were kind of asked about it and they were kind of quote-tweeting things with, like, Nepo Baby, you know, like, I guess trying to reclaim or I guess rather than have that kind of humble response of, like, um, okay, yeah, I can understand why this might seem frustrating to people, but I, I really love this and I want to do it. It's that kind of hashtagging themselves with Nepo Baby, um, which I just think is a real arrogant thing to do. But I, I've also, I, yeah, there are people in comedy who have been interviewed about, I guess, the benefits of Cambridge and Oxford or the benefits of coming from certain backgrounds. And I think it's quite frustrating to see that question asked to people who come from those backgrounds, but very rarely like, you know, I'd say working class performers of going, what do you think about the dominance of say footlights in um, comedy? It's usually someone from footlights who's asked, um, there's a lot of people in footlights and they kind of go, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not the best. It's not great that, there's such a big pool here and you know we do need to change he's think why is that the person whose voice you're asking about like um, this particular issue yeah i think i find it frustrating hearing um people who benefit from um sort of nepotism or like this kind of high class maybe being asked what their opinions are on their benefits of that because I guess then you give people a space to go, well, it's not all easy or, um, you know, it's not as bad as you think. Like, I don't know, I feel like the people who are kind of lower down the ladder don't get to speak out against it as much. I think it's one of those things like with awards ceremonies, uh, mm. which maybe is like a, a privilege that you can speak to of like nobody gets nominated Rarely. No one gets nominated who doesn't deserve it mm. in some way, whether it's because they are comedically talented or because they are um, incredibly charismatic or because they're clearly going to be a big star for other reasons or because they have a social media following. You know, whatever reasons, if you can cynically yeah, put yeah. it down to, no one is nominated who doesn't deserve it. But for everyone who's nominated, there's probably 30 other people who would equally deserve it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, you certainly get that the Edinburgh Fringe when, you know, comedians always talk towards the kind of end of the fringe where they're like, oh, who, who do you think is going to get nominated? Um, and oh, who do you think is going to get the newcomer? And there's usually like a pool of like kind of 15 or 20 people who you could name 
even while being aware that there's probably like five or ten shows I haven't seen or I don't know about. So like, yeah, you know that there's maybe like, yeah, 30 people per award who are good enough. And it just comes down to a bit of a bit of luck. And also financial things like PR and... Luck, word of mouth, what night the judge came and saw them on, what the weather was like, what the audience was like, mm. what their mood was like, you know. Yeah, and I'd be interested to know, like, how many people have been nominated in the last few years who didn't spend money on PR. Um, because, I mean, I, I really love... Um, the guy who did my PR... Uh, last year um julian hall he's so nice and so so good at his job i think it's a like really enjoyed working with him um but i think despite that and despite me using pr i do still think it's like the biggest separator at the fringe in terms of um class and who can afford to do it and i kind of wish it wasn't a thing um and there are there are a couple in particular that cost like near three grand um I, yeah I, i'd be interested to know if, if many people managed to get nominated without that expense so that was an interesting thing that i was thinking about for this last edinburgh because it was my last edinburgh for a while i basically announced during the show <laughs> Um, mm. that I would be taking a step back from live work for a little while. And I had this thought of like, well, maybe I should get a PR and go out with a bang, you know, even if my kind of comedy is not what people give awards to, I, you know, maybe I want to be on all of the lists and and mm. kind of in that in the mix in that way. Maybe that will make my sort of farewell for now a kind of a more satisfying experience and in the yeah. end it came down to I would like a babysitter <laughs> um you know my show finished at like ten thirty. My my kid wakes up at five mm. do I want someone who can like take a couple of hours in the morning so I can have a nap um or do I want to be on the lists and so yeah, for a lot yeah. of people it is that kind of decision yeah, and even with the, I think the scariest thing about like PR as well is that it's completely unquantifiable. So you you could pay for it and then make none of those lists and maybe get two reviews in, and your PR could really genuinely be trying their hardest, um, but like time slots or, or whatever is like getting in the way. But then you can't turn to someone and say oh you, you didn't get me on any, any lists and I only got two reviewers in so two grand feels very steep for two reviews because they like you know fair enough they still work they still put the hours in there's no kind of performance related thing so it, it's potentially like so I've seen people post about it post fringe it's so heartbreaking if you spend that amount of money on a three star review and a four star review from two student publications and yeah if you don't have that money to burn yeah you would start looking back and going like I could have had a babysitter I was like run ragged that month because I chose this over that like um, and that's why I got the three star review because I hadn't had any sleep the night before yeah yeah and I didn't have any you know didn't have a time for a nap and so I did a bad performance on the night that the reviewers came and that was that was it that was my two grand kind of mm. blown yeah it's a tricky yeah. it's a tricky thing because that is not nepotism you could be mm. a working class person who's just done the legwork and earned extra money and put it aside and decided that that's worth spending mm. on your edinburgh but i think you're probably less likely to do that unless you've got the kind of fallback positions that mm. middle class people have yeah yeah it's a tricky one how how are mm. you going to work through this get so rich that you become a i had a joke in my show this year of like i just want for my children what everyone wants for their children which is that in 25 years they're going to be dogpiled for being a nepo baby yeah 
<laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, as much as I could say whatever my opinion is on it now, I think. Um, yeah, if I flashed forward like thirty years and um, you had a child who was benefiting from the exact same thing, I'm sure I'd be on a podcast going, "Well, what's everyone's problem with this?" Look, I don't think it's that extreme. I think it's more like, you know, we we all have unearned privileges. You know, mm. even getting to drink clean water out of the tap, running water is an incredible privilege that lots of people don't have. But I'm not going to not drink the water. Mm. But then I feel like kind of having an awareness that it is an unearned privilege then puts some obligation on you to do something try and make yeah. it more accessible somehow to other people. Yeah, and I th- I think one thing that I see sometimes that I like, I guess when I'm getting frustrated about that kind of stuff, I my kind of brutal line will be that that's unforgivable is when people from that background or privilege I think make a what feels like a purposeful attempt to mask it because they know it's so unpopular. So like, I think, um, like some, Ivor Graham is such a funny comedian and really embraces his, like, I guess very privileged, like eat and educated Oxbridge background. But he's, um, he's such a good comedy writer and like a naturally very funny guy. But I'm um, in some kind of hypothetical world where Ivo was just doing comedy about um, oh, being into his overdraft and being um, frustrated and coming from a like um, working class background or whatever. And then you found out, like, oh, you studied at this place or you went to this place. You know, I think that would be... It's a bit sort of monstrous to pretend um, to be from another sort of thing. Um, and I think I think there are people who try and down like there's a kind of desperation to downplay it um which i think is like yeah the the frustrating thing like not that you have to kind of hang yourself out to dry because of it but no you don't have to breastfeed about it or you know feel guilty about it i think that's one of the most useless kind of manifestations Mm. of the modern kind of uh what they call white guilt thing. Yeah. Where people who have unearned privilege are then sort of self-flagellate in a really useless way, as though Mm. inflicting suffering on oneself in the form of guilt were a form of reparation. Yeah, yeah. Which it isn't. You know, this goes more generally for all kind of emotional things. I know people who, who do bad things in their relationships and then they feel terrible about them. Mm. And that feeling terrible about it doesn't do anything. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) Like, in an abstract sense, maybe it's sort of ethically better to feel terrible about it than not, but the the pain or the the hair shirt wearing or any of that stuff doesn't fix trust or repair the relationship or do anything towards mitigating any injustice. Mm. It just feels like a way of pretending giving yourself the feeling through suffering that you mm. are doing something yeah but you're not doing anything you're just feeling guilty <laughs> um yeah 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 you can be so funny with it i i think i um yeah i i've seen people on stage or on tv kind of i guess sort of mocking um posh privileged people um or kind of talking about, um, yeah, it's that thing of like, oh, God, like into my overdraft kind of thing. And sort of knowing through, you know, what you know through like comedy and the circuit and stuff where you're like, oh, but maybe you're from that kind of background and you're you're maybe trying to mask it by kind of mocking other people from that background as if that's not you that you're kind of outside of that or um yeah talking about kind of like overdrafts and things like that when you kind of own property um 
like I guess those two things aren't like um impossible to to both have but um but it, but I also know that this kind of thing is it's a chip on my shoulder um and it's something I wish I could articulate better of kind of um why I think there's not enough kind of class representation in comedy and I feel a bit incapable of um what I'd like to be which would be someone who's successful enough that I could talk about it in a useful way in a way that like um doesn't just make people go well if you were funny enough you'd be on more stuff or like if people are funny they'd be getting stuff it's nothing to do with you know Peter Kay's from a working class background you're like yeah yeah, yeah, just be undeniable that was what I was always told yeah yeah although I do come from I come from it's funny I understand the defensiveness of like oh yeah of all of that stuff because I come from a weirdly mixed background which is that we had money but a lot of it went to mum's care so we didn't Mm. have a lot of spare money (laughs) and so yeah yeah so that that was always like what I had all my life was access to privileged spaces Mm. so that for whatever like it wasn't like we we got we didn't get things also like buddhist upbringing meant that things were not a thing but yeah. when i'm looking for somewhere to work in the city and i can't find a cafe that has a table open i will with complete confidence walk into the lobby of a five star hotel and sit down and work there yeah yeah and so i yeah. have this you know and then i went to like a fancy university but i went on scholarship and so i so access to those privileged spaces and I think that's where it's really interesting because that is the kind of exact thing you're talking about, which is this mm. cl- class, which doesn't have anything necessarily to do with economics. It's just being able to speak the language or knowing the right people or knowing how to walk into a space, mm. what what fucking fork to use <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That gives you that commonality. Yeah. Do you know, what's the name of the hotel opposite the BBC Radio Theatre? Oh. Is it the the Langham? Or yes, maybe... that sounds about right. I could be wrong. But um, I remember going to see radio recordings with a friend of mine, uh, Daniel Smith. And rather than um, like having a pre-show toilet break in the kind of busy radio theater he would always say let's like i always go across the road to the to the hotel and going in to like the langham to use the toilet only before going into something else i felt like i was taking part in a heist because i <laughs> i felt like the person on the door would be like what's going on here like that immediately you'd be kind of rumbled and somehow not allowed to, to go to the toilet. Um, yeah, it, it felt very exciting um, to to do that. And, and I've been told that by a lot of people of um, when you're looking for somewhere to write that hotel lobbies are the ideal play, place to go. But I always in my head just thought, but I'm not staying at the hotel. I, even with like, you know, a travel lodge or something. But um, yeah, I think that might be my... Um, my go-to thing now and try and get in classier hotels but that's the thing like that's where this stuff actually plays out really the the feeling that Mm. you're entitled to be in a space that you're allowed to be in a space that you're welcome in a space makes a huge difference to you know a like I, I never feel welcome at a like comedy industry party. I think I bump, I, I, I mm. worked myself up into going to the end of Edinburgh Fringe party this year, and I bumped into you in like the five minutes that I could stand to be there, because I just don't feel like I'm welcome <laughs> or belong yeah. or that anyone wants me there. Yeah, I think the one this year, I think they, but it still, it kind of depends on a bit of cliques and stuff i i used to hate them so much um and the dave party that would always be like like third of the way through the uh, two thirds through the fringe or whatever 
would just be in a cool venue where everyone was drinking and everyone was crowded in and you would just see talk to people who were looking over your shoulder who else to talk to you or cliques of pre-existing like friends and I would always find it weird because most comedians who you gig with are like very nice and, and nice to chat to you and especially on like a one-on-one basis you have so much in common but I'm um, in a room of like hundreds of comedians there are people who have their kind of people that they're close friends with so you kind of know everyone but can also get a sense that they don't want to talk to you over the people they prefer to talk to you but this year at the Dave party because it was in like a games place and there was just 10 pin bowling and basketball arcade games it felt a lot more like people playing rather than people mingling and I I enjoyed that a bit more um, of not feeling like the aim at a party is to talk to a producer or an agent and try and get an in or something but um, yeah. yeah they're not easy events I, I used to um I think the first time I went to the the radio kind of end of year BBC radio kind of party sometimes I was like on the phone to someone before I went in because I couldn't see anyone I recognised and I was kind of psyching myself up a bit to be like well, do, I, do I just go in because what, what if I don't know anyone and I just sat at the bar like I really had to kind of psych myself up and sort of against my will force myself inside and they would always be fine or nice, but um, yeah, the build-up was slightly terrifying. Well, it is. If you don't know that you can feel comfortable in a space, it's really it's really hard to make yourself into that space. Mm. I I think, for me, my particular thing is that I like to be useful, or I like to be providing something, or I like to be so I can be quite confident if I'm like hey, how can I help you? You know, if Mm. I'm in a situation where I feel I have something to offer. But if I feel like I'm coming with sort of cap in hand, as you do at those parties, you're like, someone notice me, someone like me enough to come see my show. That is a much more uncomfortable position to be in. Mm. Yeah, maybe that's where, like... Nepo babies get the confidence to try these things because they feel like they have a lot to offer. Because they do. I think, like, what you're saying of, like, feeling useful... Because I remember, like, the old the old news quiz writer's room when Miles was hosting it. Because um, I, I, I haven't done it with, with, with Andy. Um, but the writer's room with Miles was quite traditional, I felt, in, like you'd basically be given two subjects for the morning and be told to kind of go off for an hour and a half, write some jokes, and then you'd come back and um, read them out and everyone could kind of chip in with stuff. But um, it takes a lot of confidence in your first time there that when people are discussing what stories should we talk about or when people are going through their jokes and you've got an idea in your head where you're like, oh, I think you could reword it like this, or here's a topper... Um, it's so scary because if you're kind of wondering what if you're wrong or what if the first one you say doesn't get a laugh and then you lose your confidence like there's definitely and it's certainly not just tied to money some people are just inherently much more confident but um, yeah it, it does take a lot of confidence to stand out in those rooms and I think if you don't you're probably not going to last too long because you don't get many opportunities to have a bit of a trial in those situations um and if you were being judged and at the end of the day people were just like oh that person didn't really say anything then you're kind of not contributing anything to that yeah. or equally that person came in way too hot and dominant and yeah talked yeah. over other people and ruined the vibe of the room yeah i think i've definitely seen like examples of both those st- styles in some form of comedy workplace where sometimes you think, oh, I think this person is too too confident. Um, yeah, I guess you want a nice middle ground of humble confidence. 
Yeah, I think the the much maligned phrase "no worries if not" I think is actually yeah, quite yeah. a quite a good feeling to have. I think this about dating a lot um, mm. in the context of it's quite a terrifying thing to be asked out by a guy who is desperate. Um, yeah, yeah. Because this like not just the potential for men to be violent, although that's always sort of like present in some corner of your mind, but that like if you say no, you'll break them. Yeah, Someone yeah. offering you something on like a quivering hand, like what could that? That's a that's a terrifying load. Whereas mm. someone being like, "Here's the door. You're welcome to leave. But if you want to stick around, it'd be nice to have you." That's yeah. a relaxing interaction. Mm. And obviously, that's in the context of like dating and relationships. But I feel like it carries through in other. What, yeah, basically, yeah. one of my New Year's resolutions is to try to pitch like that with mm. projects that I'm trying to get on because I'm going to do more writing this year is to try and go like, hey, this is a project I think is very cool. No worries if not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess you don't want someone like work-wise as well to feel like they're your last hope. That, you know, you, you've had an idea and you've had it, you've had it for 10 years and no one's bitten and that every time you pitch, you're kind of like, Please, I know this could. I know this could be good. Please, please let me do this. Um, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I'm trying to do that a bit as well of having a bit of confidence of saying, like, I think this is really good. Yeah, and 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 that you have something to offer. Mm. And I think that comes maybe the shortcut to that to bring it back to your initial point about Nepo babies, is that for Nepo babies, easy come, easy go is an easy mm. attitude to have. Yeah, Whereas yeah. if you've clawed your way desperately up to the top and you've sacrificed so much and you're sleeping in your car and you're going to auditions, it's very hard to go easy go <laughs> because it wasn't yeah, easy yeah. come. And to try yeah. and kind of yeah, perform that relaxed approach. Mm. Yeah, I, I, that makes me think, like, especially like in America... They they love that like narrative, of, you know the the American dream thing of like, um, an actor who is like, I was living in my car, I was like going to auditions, I was down to my last like, twenty pounds or whatever. Like, I'm, I'm not sure of um, I can't remember um the name now of um, the actor who, was the lead in Guardians of the Galaxy, Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt, I um, could be wrong, but I'm sure he spoke about that kind of situation. I remember The Rock talking about how little money he had, although he he was from a, I mean, a wrestling kind of dynasty. But um, yeah, Americans love that kind of like I, I battled through, and anyone can achieve anything, but then seem very uncritical of when someone else is sort of like, I'm Uma Furman's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of like that is also fantastic. Um, yeah, it just seems so weird that it's like the American dream is everything, and if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything. But we also think this child of two hot people is, you know, when you see like the newspaper waiting until they turn old enough so that they can say this person is beautiful as well, and we're allowed to say it now without seeming creepy. Like, yeah, they're I so mean, willing uh, that, to accept. That is new. I remember my era was Ashley Kate and uh, the other one, the twins, the Olsen oh, yeah, twins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were like mm. countdowns to when they quote unquote became legal. Yeah, um, yeah. It's less distasteful now, but it's still pretty gross. Yeah, like I, because from doing like topical shows, I, I always find if I'm writing on like for the news quiz or something like that, I'll kind of go on the papers I would read, like the Guardian or you know, the Independent, and then look at the Sun and the Daily Mail because um, they're just such opposing opinions on the same story. And I think you can, it's really good for getting comedy out of them. So you notice quite a lot on the Daily Mail where it will talk about like the daughter of some supermodel or a celebrity and. Like, just the language will... Could you just think, why is the Daily Mail running an article about that supermodel's 15-year-old 
daughter. And it feels like they're prepping their readership to go, I, we're not saying anything, but she's an early of legal age and she's like very soon going to be in the sidebar of our website anytime she's in a relationship or with a guy or any pictures we can show of her body in any way like you i really feel like you can see papers like the daily mail laying the foundations for um when it's legal to perv on someone because um i think I think it must be harder for them to introduce a new person to people's lives and go, look at this hot person. I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I I think it's still quite creepy how the tabloids seem to ready up the children of celebrities. Well, it's all part of the same system, I guess. Mm. And, you know, it, it that kind of ecosystem that allows for nepotism to kind of flourish. But at the same time, like, the problem of the modern age is curation. Like, there's, you know, they say there's no gatekeepers. Anyone can anyone can achieve, you know, anyone can go viral and become a celebrity. Anyone can. But mm. I think the result is actually you tend to rely more on other people's recommendations, other people's words, other filtration systems, the reliability of it being Uma Thurman's kid that they're going to not only be hot as a teenager but hot as a grown-up so you can mm -hmm. cast them in a long-running series so then they're not going to suddenly turn ugly. as a, You know, like, all of that stuff, I think, feeds into the situation that you're talking about. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, short of guillotines. Yeah. I think it's similar to when people talk about, like, diversity in TV or, or comedy commissioning, like, which is, you know, obviously, like, diversity and representation is getting better, like, um, than it was. But, um, and I, but I would say the proportion of representation, say, like, on panel shows or in who's getting commissioned scripted-wise, I'd say that would be much better than the proportion of representation in the people who are in development roles or the commissioners and stuff like that. So, like, it's so much more of a effort, I imagine, to um, to book and project diversity when it's um, largely very middle class kind of white people doing that role. And... I mean, this is going to be. This is going to sound super cynical, um, mm. but if you have to, if you're the BBC and you have to show X amount of diversity, and you happen to be a middle class, middle aged white man in a position of power in the BBC, it is better for your numbers to give one hundred different kids of an ethnic minority background one shot than it yeah, is to yeah. cultivate talent in the mm. way that you would for your friend's kid where you give yeah, them a couple yeah. of chances to be shit and you you know you're invested in their journey and you're like oh i can see the sparkle of talent there it's much mm. easier to usher 100 people through the door and say on paper that you've given 100 chances yeah, when in yeah. fact you've given nobody a foot in the door yeah it's a bit like the bbc we're talking about like i think there's a thing that older older women had very few presenting jobs like on the bbc and the bbc said oh but we've got like these four kind of over 60 year old women who are ho like lead hosts of shows and you're like yeah but the same show and it, it was like um a show about like consumer complaints i think was fronted by four kind of older women so it's like they'd gone this will be fantastic for our quarters if we let like a bunch of old women host a show together and then we can say we have six or seven people leading their own show but really it felt like they just created a show to put like a certain group of people on and arguably it's reverse sexism that they're that one of those hosts isn't a man yeah yeah there should be one young male <laughs> and four <laughs> older women 
hosting that very mild consumer complaints show. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a sitcom yeah. I would like to see made. Um, we should wrap this up. This has been a lovely mm. conversation, In um, Where can people find you online? Where can they support your work uh, in real life or on the internet? Um, probably best to, I guess, like, I'm using Instagram more than anything else, but all, like, the social media stuff is usually just kind of slash Ian Smith comedy. Um, I have a website that I don't think I've updated in maybe six years. Um, I don't really need As to is traditional. Someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, usually like, Instagram um, would be best, um, and that's where I put all the kind of links in the bio and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then this year, kind of January to April, I'll be going on tour. So I'm doing maybe, I should know how many dates, but I don't. But I'd say around 15 dates. Um, yeah, that's my that's my life at the minute. Do you have any specials out uh, that people can find? Um, yeah, with the Edinburgh show kind of previous to this one's available on Next Up called Half Life. Um, so that's the only one I think there's, there is one on my YouTube channel but I, I will I will say the, the quality of the filming is, is awful I would say the quality of the comedy though is very good I highly recommend you look up Ian's comedy because it's oh, extraordinarily you. well written um, excellent thank you so much for having tea with me no you're welcome thanks for having me Oh, do you know her or do you not? This top is mistress that we have got. Elsie Thompson, it is her name, and she helps the doffers at every frame. Lousy rifle doll, I